because I have some it's interaction good. to do, and so I want to make sure Trista has a uh, uh, full hour to to go over all the the chapters. Um, so I would like to welcome everyone to Trista's defense. It's a dissertation defense. I welcome the committee and everyone in the audience. I think Zoom opens up new opportunities that we take advantage. So we have national and international audience today. And so let me take you back to 2016 when Trista started this journey of graduate study. Um, on this photograph, you can actually see Trista holding a placard proudly winning a national virtual poster contest. And uh, that was actually thanks to Trista's undergrad work on which they published two papers and got this great award. So I think that was really encouraging to continue on to, to a gra graduate program. A uh, little did Trista know that you would end up in shady places in Hawaii and not only surrounded by the nice paradise as everyone imagines it to be, um, that we would go into the dirtiest waters and um, even despite warning signs from others because in fact the, the research that Trista embarked on um, is about wastewater, so cesspools and uh, leaky sewer lines. And despite of all that, Trista have always kept up the enthusiasm, uh, was great doing field lab work and any other work with Trista. Uh, Trista was always prepared to go out, um, very well prepared to go out in the field, all the equipment tested, lined up in the lab. And you see that we have had quite many jury rigged as well as very professionally uh, done instruments. So thank you, Trista, for, for working through all of this. Um, and so this, these pictures are on a research that we studied as a Sea Grant um, fellow. Then um, Trista became a Data Science Institute fellow and finally EcoWise scholar. That took, her to, uh, that took Trista to um, a bit cleaner waters and more sunshine. And Trista was also always eager, or has been, always eager to participate in many other projects. So the three chapters you will hear about today are really just one part. There is so much more that Trista has been doing, such as tackling electronical problems like you see on the left image there, um, really beyond of what, what Trista originally signed up for, meaning chemistry. So, so that's great, that shows Trista's versatility in really um, uh, doing cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary research. And what's also great is that Trista has always been so open and eager to, to do outreach and mentoring. Here are some images that you see with um, an RU fellow that Trista mentor, mentored. Uh, we have done multiple different outreaches, lessons at elementary schools, hosted at the open house at SOAST or at Bishop Museum and other events. And also uh, Trista took active part in advising and mentoring undergraduate students in my lab. And really the mentoring um, and outreach efforts span nationally for Trista because they got involved in both AGU and GSA um, and ASLO um, outreach um, efforts. And all of these activities have not gone unnoticed. Trista received multiple awards already as an undergrad and then just continued and multiplied during the graduate studies. Um, uh, the few that I would like to mention were obviously the AGU recognition, the ARCS award, Bullard Fellowship from the department, GSA Special Honorable Mention uh, for a very well done proposal, a Lorex International Internship Participant, um, EKY Scholar, and, and many others. So I would like to really um, uh, thank Trista for this great journey. As I said, the three chapters you will hear about are, are just one part of the story. And um, so please embrace that. Uh, Trista has really um, uh, explored 
parts of our watersheds that, that really don't get that much attention. Um, and so um, uh, I hope you will enjoy these presentations. And in life, you will now be covered with lace, Trista. <laughs> and so that's maybe I, I hear might happen at the end of the talk. Nevertheless, I would like to invite everyone, um, despite, um, uh, of course, the defense not yet being successfully done, but I am hopeful. And so we will uh, have a little celebration at five o'clock today, Hawaii Standard Time. Please email me or Trista. If you don't yet have a Zoom link, I will send it out to the usual lists um, after the talk, after the defense. And with that, I don't wanna use any much, any more of Trista's time. Um, Trista, the mic is yours. Thank you, Henrietta. That was a really nice introduction. I just got to um, real quickly pop up. Um, that. And that. Um, let me just do that. All right. Uh, can you all see my screen or can someone confirm that I'm sharing? Yep. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. It looks like it's a large crowd. Um, and I think I'll just jump right in. Oops. There it is. Okay, great. Um, before starting, I wanted to give a quick overview about the organization of the presentation today. Uh, first, I will go over a brief introduction that introduces the concepts relevant to the rest of the presentation. After that, I'm going to discuss three chapters of my dissertation, all which relate to the use of geochemical tracers. And finally, I will wrap up with a quick conclusion that summarizes the take home messages from the presentation. The overarching objectives for my dissertation aim to convey the importance of groundwater in the context of water quality and to do so through the use of geochemical tracers. The main goals are to one, link groundwater and its impacts to water quality ridge to reef, two, improve wastewater tracing in natural waters using novel tracers, and three, using a combination of groundwater and wastewater tracers, look to the future, aiming to address the question, how will sea level rise impact coastal water quality? To help contextualize the rest of the presentation, I want to first cover the relevant parts of the water cycle. Precipitation falls on the land, and then this can either run off over the surface as stream flow, or it can infiltrate into the ground as groundwater. This groundwater then travels and can discharge to streams as stream base flow, or to the coastal ocean as submarine groundwater discharge, or SGD. Importantly, uh, water, both surface water and groundwater, connect the land to the ocean. Total SGD, or the sum of fresh and saline SGD, is influenced by both terrestrial and marine forces, which can be important to distinguish from one another, particularly in the context of water resources and pollution. The primary terrestrial driver is the difference in the groundwater level, or the hydraulic gradient. From the marine side, forces such as tidal pumping, wave setup, localized pressure gradients, and long-term ocean water fluctuations all influence the magnitude of SGD. Total SGD is volumetrically important to the water budget um, on a global scale, but it's also particularly important for small volcanic islands, where SGD makes up a disproportionate contribution to the coastal ocean relative to stream flow and land mass. Groundwater is not only volumetrically important, it's also important from a chemical perspective because it's comparatively enriched in nutrients, metals, and other chemical constituents derived from land use. Groundwater is easily contaminated and natural remediation can be challenging in low oxygen environments typical of the subsurface. In comparison to pollution associated with surface runoff, which tends to be episodic in nature, groundwater represents a continuous source for contamination to reach natural waters. SGD is a well-established vector for excess nutrients, metals, and carbon to reach the coastal ocean, leading to poor water quality, harmful algal blooms, eutrophication, and coral reef degradation. Wastewater is a common source of contamination worldwide. Globally, an estimated 1,900 trillion liters per year of wastewater is generated, 80% uh, of which is released to the environment untreated. 
So the map here shows the percentage of the population that is connected to wastewater collection. For instance, this is about 80, or sorry, 71% of the population in the US. Aging or inadequate wastewater infrastructure is another driver of wastewater contamination. And leakage often goes undetected for years because it is difficult to detect and isolate the source. For instance, the EPA estimates that 23% of sewer lines are currently leaking in the US. Another potential source of wastewater discharge, which are particularly relevant in Hawaii, are on-site sewage disposal systems, or OSDS. OSDS are personal receptacles for household waste and sewage, and can be a major source of groundwater contamination. The most common form of OSDS in Hawaii is a cesspool. Uh, these do not offer any form of waste treatment, and the leachate is often in direct contact with the groundwater itself. Of the roughly 110,000 OSDS units in Hawaii, about 80% of them are cesspools. And so the figure here shows the typical construction of a cesspool, where wastewater enters the cesspool as influent, solids will then settle on the bottom, and then the fluids can leach out of the sides. About half of the active cesspools in Hawaii are deemed a risk to water resources given their proximity to streams, the coast, or drinking water resources. Cesspools are estimated to leach about 53 million gallons per day of raw sewage into the ground statewide. And to make matters worse, Hawaii was the last state to ban the construction of new cesspools just recently in March 2016. And for perspective, Rhode Island was the last state before Hawaii to ban the construction of new cesspools in 1958. Which brings us to an important question. How will sea level rise impact coastal wastewater infrastructure and water quality? Globally, there's a disproportionate development along the coast, where about 40% of the population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast, and eight out of the 10 most populous cities are coastal. Both population density and population are increasing in coastal areas and are projected to increase in the coming decades. Rising sea levels raise the water table, leading to groundwater inundation and potentially then negative impacts on water quality. One pathway for sea level rise to impact coastal wastewater infrastructure is to be uh, through a direct routing, such as the, uh, through the inundation of OSDS or fractured sewer lines. And the figure here illustrates this effect, where under current sea levels, many coastal OSDS are already compromised because they don't have a sufficient depth above the water table for natural remediation to occur. But under future sea levels, many of these coastal OSDS will become inundated, removing any potential for natural remediation. An alternative pathway for sea level rise to impact coastal wastewater infrastructure is through direct means, such as through storm, or an indirect means, such as storm drain backflow. Um, and in this case, wastewater leachate from leaky sewer lines or OSDS can reach the storm drain network via seawater and groundwater inundation. Tracers are a means to study processes in the environment, and their use is a focus of my work. Naturally occurring radioisotopes of radon and radium are excellent, well-established tracers for groundwater. And the most commonly used ones are highlighted in white on the figure. So we have three or four isotopes of radium and one isotope of radon. These isotopes differ from one another in terms of decay rate and also primordial parent isotope. And the primordial parents are indicated in the red. And the combination of these isotopes can be used to trace not only groundwater, but also estimate water residence time and characterize water circulation. Another tracer I will be talking about a lot today are contaminants of emerging concern, or CECs. CECs include compounds such as pharmaceuticals, endocrine disrupting chemicals, industrial chemicals, pesticides, and other anthropogenically sourced compounds that are resistant to degradation in the environment. As such, they're considered environmentally persistent, generally in trace quantities, and are sourced from poor removal efficiencies in wastewater treatment plants, sewage leaks, and industrial and agricultural runoff. Most CECs are also unregulated. And even in trace quantities, CECs have been demonstrated to have negative impacts on the ecosystem. And for instance, even nanogram per liter quantities of endocrine disrupting chemicals, such as those found in birth control pills, have been linked to increased intersexuality of invertebrates. While their degradation pathways differ in the environment, CECs can also be used as a tracer for anthropogenic pollution. The table on the bottom of the slide highlights the behavior and degradation pathways based on the chemical parameters for the compounds I will talk about today. What I really want to highlight here is that the behavior is quite different between compounds, but this is also something that we can use to our advantage in the context of tracing wastewater. 
All right, so that concludes the introduction. Moving on to chapter two, entitled Parallels Between Stream and Coastal Water Quality Associated with Groundwater Discharge. This chapter aims to demonstrate the linkage between land and the coastal ocean through groundwater discharge in a polluted watershed. The motivation for this chapter is to connect groundwater discharge to both streams and the coastal ocean and connect these to water quality. Studies rarely consider the whole system as a continuum and instead tend to focus on either streams or the coastal ocean. But as you can see from the figure and probably from your own experience, there's no physical boundary between streams or the coast, nor separating base flow to streams from SGD. This figure illustrates a cross section of groundwater resources for the windward side of Oahu flowing into Kaneohe Bay. Upslope, the streams are fed groundwater by the dikes as high level aquifer base flow. Perennial streams in this area can comprise a large portion of groundwater compared to surface runoff, commonly up to 70% during the dry season. Closer to the coast, streams are instead fed groundwater by basal aquifer base flow from the freshwater lens. And then in the coastal ocean, SGD is the main source of groundwater to water bodies. Surface runoff uh, primarily will occur as stream flow or during high precipitation events as storm runoff. The objectives for this chapter are to one, quantify groundwater and surface water fluxes in a ridge to reef concept, two, assess water quality impacts along the stream coastal continuum, and three, look at temporal variations of SGD, water and nutrient fluxes during the 2017 high sea level anomaly, comparing Peringian spring tides, otherwise known as king tides, to spring tides. We conducted a field-based study in streams flowing into Kaneohe Bay as well as the nearshore area. Kaneohe Bay has been traditionally divided into three sectors, the northwest, central, and southern sectors. Uh, these are indicated on the map on the slide. Uh, the degree of urbanization, population, and impervious surface all increase from the northwest to the southern sectors, while the number of OSDS and the percentage of agricultural land decreases. Also, uh, detailed stream studies were conducted in three sub-watersheds, including Kahalu'u, Ahuimanu, and Kaneohe sub-watersheds, which, which were selected to capture both spatial and land use differences. Here's a closer look at these sub-watersheds. Kahalu'u, this is shown right here, um, has the greatest number of OSDS. These are shown by these small gray dots here, um, including over 200 cesspools and an OSDS density that exceeds 33 units per square kilometer. Beaches in this area have actually been closed since 2014 for recreational activities due to the high fecal indicator bacteria counts potentially related to the high density of OSDS. While Ahui Manu and Kaneohe watersheds have fewer OSDS, they still may be subject to wastewater pollution from leaky sewer lines. Also shown on this map in orange are the portions of the stream that are lined with concrete as a means of flood control and ranges from 35 to 56 percent of the total length of the stream, which may have negative environmental consequences. To investigate groundwater and surface water discharge to streams in the coastal ocean, I used a combination of radon and stream discharge measurements to quantify groundwater and surface water flow, Makai or Rich to Reef. Radon surveys and time series were conducted along the coast and in streams to derive groundwater discharge using a mass balance model. And then coupling radon and stream discharge measurements, surface water and groundwater fluxes were then partitioned and allowed for discharge per portion of the stream or coastline to be quantified. In addition to the groundwater story, nutrients were collected um, from surface water and groundwater in streams along the coast and from upland wells. Um, and there were over 180 samples collected in total. Uh, we have results for both dry and wet seasons, but today in the interest of time, I'm only gonna focus on the dry season. Here we have radon concentrations in becquerels per cubic meter in streams and the coastal ocean for the study area. Um, surface water concentrations are shown by the lines and then groundwater samples are shown by the dots. The major takeaway here is that because radon is a tracer for groundwater, any location where the color is warmer than this medium blue indicates a groundwater input. This map demonstrates that both groundwater discharge or that groundwater discharge is a prevalent to both the streams and the coastal ocean in the study area. Now that we have evidence for groundwater discharge, what's actually in the water and where is it coming from? Previous studies have really focused on the role of surface runoff and stream flow 
uh, in delivering nutrients to the coast, particularly for Kaneohe Bay, but our results demonstrate that these are really primarily sourced from groundwater. 82 to 95 percent of the nitrogen flux was sourced from groundwater. Uh, and again, this includes both stream-based flow and SGD, and this was for the northwest and southern sectors. Digging into this a bit further, we were able to demonstrate that these nitrogen fluxes are primarily derived from SGD, with stream base flow contributing 21 to 42% of the total nitrogen to the system. These results really highlight the importance of groundwater as a contributor to water quality. And SGD, while it is receiving increasing recognition as a frequently neglected um, part in many water quality studies, it's still, um, is frequently neglected and needs to be addressed more. And this is only going to get worse. During the summer of 2017, Hawaii experienced anomalously high king tides, which are projected to become the typical spring tidal height in the next 30 years. With increasing sea level and tidal heights, the unsaturated space, which is where the OSDS currently reside, will become smaller, meaning there's an increased chance for groundwater contamination. So we conducted two radon time series at Kahalu'u Beach Park to compare king tide and spring tide groundwater discharge. During the spring tide, we found average SGD rates of 0.04 meters per day and dissolved inorganic nitrogen fluxes of about 0.38 moles per day. For the king tide, average SGD rates were more than three times greater than the spring tide and dissolved inorganic nitrogen fluxes were almost four times greater. I'm going to come back to this point again in chapter four, but what I want to highlight here is the significance of the result. So while the Hawaii Department of Health has mandated the conversion of all cesspools to septic tanks by 2050, with increasing sea levels, coastal OSDS are projected to become inundated. And this is in addition to increased groundwater and nutrient discharge, which we already know are negatively impacting coastal water quality. Our major findings from chapter two include one, Groundwater fluxes, which again include both base flow and SGD, are equivalent to those derived from surface runoff. Two, nutrient concentrations and fluxes derived from uh, SGD were greater than those found in streams. And three, king tide SGD and nutrient fluxes were greater than those observed during a spring tide, which have concerning water quality implications for the future. We're going to briefly leave Hawaii now for chapter three, which is entitled Submarine Groundwater Discharge, a previously undocumented source of contaminants of emerging concern to the coastal ocean, Sydney, Australia. This chapter builds upon chapter two by focusing on SGD as a pollutant vector, while also working to develop the use of CECs as wastewater tracers in a highly urbanized environment. As I mentioned previously, vectors for contamination to coastal waters can either occur via groundwater or surface water flow. And again, groundwater tends to be a continuous source, one that is uh, enriched in pollutants sourced from anthropogenic activities. But, a few but few studies have looked at SGD as a source of contaminants of emerging concern, despite the fact that in many areas, uh, persistent pollution cannot be fully explained by other sources. This study evaluates SGD as a transport pathway for wastewater and industrial runoff to the coastal ocean using CECs as tracers. We hypothesize that one, SGD is a pathway for wastewater and industrial runoff to coastal waters, and two, CEC concentrations and detection frequencies will be driven by sources across the urban land use gradient and coastal residence times. These hypotheses were tested in Sydney, Australia, focusing on Sydney Harbor and Botany Bay. Greater Sydney is a highly urbanized city with a population greater than 5 million and a population density exceeding 10,000 people per square kilometer in places. For this study, we focused on five embayments, Foreshore Beach, which is in Botany Bay, this is near the Sydney airport, if you know the area, and then also Homebush, Hen and Chicken, Roselle, and Watson's Bays in Sydney Harbor. These sites were selected to capture the land use gradient and compare urban versus industrial sources. Previous studies in this area have primarily linked pollution in the harbor to storm runoff. However, high fecal indicator bacteria counts and other indicators of wastewater input have been observed during dry periods with no specified source, suggesting that SGD may be a source of this pollution. Field work was conducted along shore perpendicular transects for each embayment, collecting groundwater samples from beach dug wells and surface water samples along transects up to 50 meters from shore. 
Groundwater discharge was determined using radium isotopes, which again differ in terms of half-life from one another, and thus can also be used to approximate coastal residence time. To study pollution presence, we analyzed samples for six different CECs. Uh, one of these, the dioxins, are an industrial chemical and the rest are pharmaceuticals. And then we also analyzed for nutrients and dissolved organic carbon to compare with the CEC data. We found that SGD is an important source of water to Sydney Harbor and Botany Bay. The figure here shows um, SGD in cubic meters per day, and this is for each of the studied embayments. And then um, we also have the range for advection rates given in centimeters per day for each site. SGD and advection rates were highest at Foreshore Beach and lowest at Watson's Bay. Um, we also estimated residence times using the radium isotopes and found that they ranged from less than four days up to 17 days and that residence times were highest at Roselle and Watson's Bays. CEC detection frequencies were largely driven by the resistance to degradation and the popularity of consumption. To illustrate this, caffeine was detected in 100% of our samples. Previous studies have linked caffeine concentrations and detection frequencies to population density, so this was not uh, too surprising of a result. Carbamazepine and dioxins had the second highest detection frequencies, both were 95%, but both do not have easy pathways for degradation once in the environment. Detection frequencies for the rest of the compounds, which are more prone to degradation in the environment or less commonly consumed, ranged from 18 to 82%. We also uh, estimated both total CEC fluxes and SGD derived fluxes to determine the quantity and percentage of uh, the SGD delivers of CECs to the coastal ocean. Again, in the interest of the time, I'm only going to focus on the SGD derived flux, which for some of the sites, the CEC flux was actually largely SGD derived. This highlights the importance of uh, SGD as a vector for CECs to reach the coastal ocean. We found that uh, Foreshore Beach had the highest SGD derived fluxes of carbamazepine, caffeine, ibuprofen, and dioxins, in addition to also having the highest percentage ranging up to 100% of caffeine and ibuprofen discharged via SGD to our study sites. Hen and Chicken Bay had the highest SGD-derived flux of sulfamethoxazole, ranging up to 90% of the total flux. And then Roselle and Watson's Bay had the highest SGD-derived fluoroquinolones fluxes, but for both of these sites, the percentage of fluoroquinolones that's delivered via SGD was quite low, and it was well under 10%. But one of our key findings is that water residence times drive CEC concentrations. Pollution confidence levels were calculated using the equation on the bottom of the slide. And in this study, pollution confidence levels are really driven by CEC concentrations themselves and not the presence or absence of a specific compound or nutrient or DOC concentrations. The figure shows median pollution confidence versus residence time and demonstrates that longer residence times result in higher CEC concentrations, provided that there is a source of pollution to the water body. This relationship between residence time and coastal CEC inventories confirms that coastal mixing leads to reduced coastal inventories of these persistent chemicals. We also wanted to evaluate the potential effect that these CECs may have on the ecosystem. To do this, we calculated risk quotients for each CEC using literature values for the predicted no effect concentration or PNEC, which are based off of the point that a concentration of a substance leads to 50% of a species experiencing mortality or suppression of a biological function such as growth or reproduction. A risk quotient greater than one means that the compound poses a high risk to the ecosystem. Here I want to highlight two compounds, dioxins and ibuprofen, both which pose a high risk to aquatic wildlife as all samples greater than the detection limit had risk quotients greater than one, even ranging up to 16 for the dioxins. This means that despite the fact we have observed these compounds in nanogram per liter concentrations, they still pose a high risk to the ecosystem. CECs, while applied in the study primarily as tracers, should arguably also be considered pollutants in this case as well. Our main findings from chapter three include, one, for the observed embayments, coastal residence time plays a major role in regulating CEC inventories, where water mixing leads to decreased CEC inventories. Two, um, SGD plays a major role in delivering CECs to the coastal ocean. And three, dioxins and ibuprofen were in concentrations that pose a high risk to aquatic wildlife.
Last but not least, we'll move on now to chapter four, entitled Increasing Coastal Contaminant Fluxes with Sea Level Rise. Current evidence for tidally driven groundwater inundation of wastewater infrastructure under high spring tides. This chapter aims to link findings from chapter two and three from a future looking perspective. This chapter was motivated by the fact that model-based studies show groundwater inundation of coastal wastewater infrastructure under future sea levels or even during king tide levels occurring today. In Hawaii, development is concentrated along the coast, often at sea level, meaning that changes in sea level are direct threats to coastal infrastructure. For instance, these photos are from the industrial district of Mapunapuna. This is located near the Honolulu airport. And this area experiences nuisance flooding during spring tides or heavy rains via that actually it comes out through the storm drains. And one can only expect situations such as this to become exacerbated in the future. The hypotheses for this chapter are one, spring tides can be used as a modern day proxy for future sea levels, allowing us to gather field based evidence of, or information about tidally driven inundation of wastewater infrastructure and its discharge to storm drains in the coastal ocean, and two, that we can trace these processes using a combination of SJD and wastewater tracers. This study investigates how sea level rise may impact wastewater infrastructure in the larger Honolulu urban area. We looked at two pathways for discharge. The first was direct discharge to the coastal zone via SGD, and the second was through storm drain backflow. The study focused in two low-lying areas with predominantly reclaimed land. We studied the indirect pathway in Mapunapuna, again an industrial area that has been experiencing nuisance flooding during spring tides or heavy rains for over a decade. Waikiki, as we all know, is a hub for tourism, and that was the main location for studying the coastal discharge in this study. In part because of the narrow unsaturated space, previous studies by Havel et al. have demonstrated that 89% of coastal OSDS were at least partially inundated during the 2017 kink tides. For this study, we used tracers once again to study groundwater and wastewater discharge. Groundwater discharge was measured using radon, and we coupled radon measurements with CECs as tracers for wastewater. Radon time series were conducted during spring tides to document groundwater discharge, and we collected samples during low, mid, and high tide for CECs as well as nutrients to investigate the wastewater connection. Here are the radon time series results for the Waikiki coastal sites. Radon concentrations are shown in the red line. Um, salinity is in this dashed blue line. This is over time. Uh, and these are separated by site and by king and spring tides. And then we also have the timing of low, mid, and high tide sampling indicated on each plot. What I really want to highlight here is that during the king tide, SGD fluxes were up to 3.4 times greater compared to the spring tide for coastal sites, demonstrating increased groundwater discharge and connectivity. In Mapunapuna, two out of the three storm drains showed significant increases in both radon and salinity at high tide, demonstrating a tidally influenced connection between groundwater and the storm drains. These sites are also about 500 meters from the coast, so it's impressive to see a tidal influence of this magnitude. The other storm drain site, SD3, which is not directly connected to SD1 and SD2, had decreasing radon concentrations from low to high tide, coincident with increasing salinity suggesting a different scenario is occurring, at least for the groundwater inundation story at this site. But these results still indicate a groundwater connection to the storm drain. Now that we've established that there is a tidally driven groundwater connection, what's actually in the water? Um, I don't have time today to go uh, into detail about everything shown in the figure. What I really want to highlight here is that this is a highly dynamic system. The plot shows sampling location by low, mid, and high tide. That's what the L, M, and H mean by study site. Um, and then um, Waikiki up here for the coastal sites, surface water versus groundwater, and then storm drains versus coastal and Mapuna Puna. And then uh, I'm going to bring your attention now to the bar graph, um, which shows the distribution amongst nitrogen species. The green indicates uh, nitrate and nitrite concentrations. The blue is ammonium, and the yellow is dissolved organic nitrogen. In most of the samples, the total nitrogen is split amongst those species, and in some cases, nearly 50-50 DON along with some other nitrogen species, which is not favorable under steady state conditions. 
The other point I want to make here is that over 94% of the samples collected had one or more detectable CEC compound present. Carbamazepine and caffeine, similar to findings in chapter three, were the most frequently detected. Fluoroquinolones were only detected in those two storm drains that are connected to one another, but was otherwise below detection in all other samples. The presence of CECs and their fluctuation with tides provides concrete evidence for tidally driven inundation of wastewater infrastructure. Delving into this a bit further, I did a principal components analysis for all of the coastal samples. So here, these are all the same PCA, but are color coded differently according to different groupings. So A shows groundwater versus surface water, B shows low, mid versus high tide, C shows king tide versus spring tide, and then D is by sampling site. These groupings can be really broken down into reducing versus oxidizing conditions, where reducing conditions are more prevalent when terrestrial forces are the dominant control on groundwater discharge. At high tide or during king tides, there's a greater presence of oxygenated conditions from the influence of the well oxygenated seawater. Let's now break this down from the perspective of tidal heights. So here we have low versus high tide, Waikiki is up here and Mapuna Puna is here, and the gradient coloring on top of the land indicates cesspool density. Um, and then we have also CEC and nutrient scores by study site. The CEC and nutrient scores are just a means to normalize CEC compounds and nutrient species. So for the Waikiki sites, uh, CEC scores increase from low to high tide, illustrating an increased flux from wastewater infrastructure at high tide. The opposite trend was observed for the storm drains in Mapunapuna, and here we attribute this to the difference in the environment. In Waikiki, there was a greater number of cesspools along with presumably some leaky sewer lines, and as the groundwater level rises with the tide, there's increased connection and infiltration between the wastewater infrastructure and the groundwater, which then subsequently will flow to the coast. In Mapuna Puna, there are fewer cesspools, and really seawater intrusion is leading to the dilution of sewage effluent from the sewer lines that are continuously leaking. At higher water levels, this leaking sewage is increasingly connected to the storm drain network and then overflows onto the sidewalks and street. Again, while CECs are applied here as wastewater tracers, they once again pose an environmental risk similar to findings in Chapter 3. Average risk quotients for surface water and storm drain samples were above one, demonstrating that even under current conditions, CECs are in concentrations that pose a high risk to the ecosystem. In many cases, as shown in the table, these risk quotients greatly exceed one, even up to 26 for fluoroquinolones at one of the storm drain sites. Overall risk quotients were high risk in 62% of samples uh, for carbamazepine and caffeine, and 24% for the fluoroquinolones. In conclusion, here we provide field-based evidence for tidally driven groundwater inundation of wastewater infrastructure. This is already occurring today during spring tides and will worsen with increasing sea levels. Importantly, wastewater leakage and groundwater inundation lead to saturated conditions in the unsaturated zone, reducing the capacity for bioremediation to occur. Septic systems and cesspools and coastal aquifers in general don't offer effective wastewater treatment because of the porous geology and groundwater level. And this issue will only become exacerbated by sea level rise, population increase, and the unavailability of appropriate, tr appropriate treatment technologies. Finally, I want to wrap up this presentation with a few salient points or take home messages. Groundwater is a pathway for contaminants to reach coastal waters. For instance, along the stream coastal continuum, both base flow and SGD negatively impact coastal water quality. And while SGD has received um, the most attention for its role in delivering excess nutrients to the coast, it's also a source of CECs, which are frequently in concentrations that have negative consequences for aquatic organisms. Finally, sea level rise will be a catalyst for a decrease in water quality through the inundation of wastewater infrastructure. And importantly, this process is already occurring today under spring tide conditions. I want to take a couple moments to thank everyone. Uh, I, won't, I can't thank everyone. I have too many people to thank. That'd be a whole other hour long presentation. Um, but none of this work would have been possible without the support I've received. Uh, 12 years ago, I completed an associate's degree in video game design. 
And while I had always hoped to have the opportunity to attend university, I didn't think it was ever going to be an option for me. So if you had asked me then what I would have been doing in 2020, defending a PhD would have been nowhere near that list. Um, but I also guess a global pandemic and staying inside for eight months also wouldn't have been on that list. So I guess it's, it's hard to predict the future. But first and foremost, I want to thank Henrietta for her inspiring and supportive advising. I've always felt that she's been in my corner from the time I started working in her lab as an undergrad until now. And Throughout this, she has constantly motivated and encouraged me to seek out opportunities to approach science rigorously and innovatively and to challenge myself. And I, I would not be here today without Henrietta's support, so thank you. I also want to acknowledge my committee, Brian, Chip, Scott, and Harry, for their support and sharing their knowledge with, and expertise with me. I look forward to applying the, all that I've learned from all of you over the years to future endeavors. Um, I also want to thank Bridget for taking time out of her busy schedule to be on my comprehensive exam committee and Bob who was on my master's committee and was very helpful for the first chapter of this dissertation. I also need to thank numerous funding sources that have contributed to the science and the success of my PhD as well as the Hawaii Department of Health Honolulu, or Hawaii Department of Transportation and the Honolulu Board of Water Supply for providing access to field sites. I've had the opportunity to participate in several projects or receive funding from various projects over the course of my graduate school career that I, I didn't discuss today. So I want to thank everyone involved with the Hawaii Data Science Institute and the EKY project for uh, giving me the opportunities to further develop my data science skills and apply them to projects that address water quality and resources. Um, I've also been very fortunate to have awesome and supportive uh, office mates, um, Diamond and Brittany, you two are the best. Thank you for all of the great advice and support over the years. I miss seeing you guys in person and going to the office, and I, I hope we can all hang out again soon. Um, I also want to thank Arlene, Lily, and Susan for all of their help over the years from the financial and administrative side. Um, clearly, I would have been completely lost without your guys' help, so thank you so much. This PhD required a lot of field and lab work, which was only successful because of the people here who helped. I also want to mention that about 95% of the time we were working in gross, polluted environments and carrying heavy gear through long hours in the hot sun and through dirty water. So I'm immensely thankful to uh, everyone who still signed up to come along, knowing that we weren't gonna be lounging at the beach and you'd probably feel like you should burn everything you were wearing once you got home. Um, yeah, the people here are pretty awesome. Um, and I also need to thank everyone in Australia for making me feel welcome and part of the group, despite only being there for two months. In particular, I want to thank Isaac for ensuring that my research was not only successful, but also that it was an enjoyable experience and for taking lots of time out of his busy schedule to mentor me and give feedback. I also want to specifically thank the group that helped with the field work um, in Sydney, I don't think I've ever had field work go so smoothly, and it was because we had such a great team of knowledgeable, easy to get along with, and hardworking people, and I, I hope we get to work again in the, together in the future. Thank you, of course, to my fellow grad students and friends in Hawaii. I don't think this PhD would have been possible without all of you, and we've had a lot of fun together, and I feel so fortunate to have such an awesome, adventurous, supportive group of friends. You guys are the best and I'm excited for when we can hang out in person again as well, whenever that is. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to the old crew, Kate, Julie, Genesis, Daniel, Michael, Liz, and Warren. Uh, most of you have since moved to the mainland, but uh, thank you for making the first few years of grad school particularly fun. I also want to thank my family for their love and support. To my parents, thank you for teaching me to think out of the box and the value of hard work. To my sisters, thank you for being awesome in all of the good times, both in Seattle and when you came to visit me here. Um, and I also want to thank Warren's parents for making me feel part of the family and encouraging me to pursue a bachelor's degree because I obviously would not be here today had that not happened. And now look at what you've done. This is, I have done all the school I can do. Um, and finally, I want to thank Warren and Breadfruit. I could not have asked for a better support network. 
Throughout the years, we have had um, all sorts of crazy adventures. And because of Warren, um, my worldview and ambitions have greatly expanded. Uh, Warren has been very patient and supportive and really my number one fan, and I could not have done it without him. I also need to thank Breadfruit, who I see is now on the camera, um, for being a good boy and for all of the love he gives and whose enthusiasm for 2020, once we started working from home, has really made this entire pandemic much more tolerable. And finally, I want to thank all of you for attending today. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Trista. So uh, please feel free to either unmute yourself and ask your question or add it in the chat. And Trista, I will monitor the chat for you. That's I'm going to slightly break from tradition and lay up Trista now because we don't have the standard milling around afterwards thing with Zoom. All right, go for it. You can all think of your questions you want to ask me then. I want to encourage the audience to uh, pose their questions. The committee members will, will have plenty of time after this session, so please go ahead. Uh, this is Russell from the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, some of the, one of the questions would be, uh, what would you suggest in terms of the city and the state of Hawaii, in terms of how do we address if this is a significant portion of the pollution is coming from wastewater? What are other communities doing or what are other states that uh, have uh, cesspools located near the coastal areas, what are they considering uh, doing? Well, I think, um, okay, so there, there are multiple parts to your question. Just keep answering. Okay. Um, I, you know, the, there's one aspect in which I think Hawaii is somewhat unique um, in that it's, um, we're very highly developed, but, um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank you, actually, everyone. Actually, oh, there's more. Oh, there's more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, Hawaii is uh, very highly developed. We're a first world um, place, um, yet we have so many cesspools. And so I think there, it's kind of a unique problem there in some ways. Um, I think, you know, there's some really interesting um, thoughts going on right now with um, using different kinds of um, bioremediation in cesspools or alternatives that may be cheap replacements for cesspools that I think could be kind of intriguing, kind of using the activated um, charcoal methods. Um, and I, I, I think that might have a key in this. Um, you know, but it's really hard to say because it is such a, um, it's a challenging question, right? We have so much development and <laughs> economic development along the coast. We can't, and we don't have the space to really move back, right? So what do we do? Um, I, in general, I would think we need to increase our monitoring of wastewater to waters in general and have a better idea of really what's in the subsurface. Thank you. Uh, the last point I wanted to make was, uh, I guess you had a slide uh, regarding uh, Mapuna Puna and sea level rise. And I just wanted to let you know that uh, Mapuna Puna was historically a fill area, and it was placed over uh, deep lagoonal deposits. And uh, the settlement that is occurring there is about two times the amount of sea level rise. So it's a combination issue over there, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a tough one. Uh, so it will be, it will be our, probably our number one challenge area because it's still sinking. It, it will con it's been sinking since it was developed. Uh, right. So I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's just not sea level rise, but it's the, the entire ground surface is sinking. Uh, absolutely, it's a, it's a multi-pronged problem. Thank you, Russell. Steve Martel's hand is raised, Trista. Oh, um, let me see, I don't know. 
Trista, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, that was a great presentation. Um, I've got two questions. One of them is a follow-up on Russell's. What do you think is the, the most important thing that should be done at this point to try to deal with the, the general problem? It's, you know, it's really, it's, it's hard to say, right? I, you know, I'm tempted to say, oh, well, we need to deal with all of these cesspools, but really, you know, all OSDS are kind of a problem if you're in the coastal area, right? So, and certainly there are leaky sewer lines that are really difficult to detect. So I almost feel what we need to do is increase our monitoring, increase the data we have so that we can address these problems in the order of importance, because I think there's just a lot of data that we we don't have, right? Um, so that would be my first suggestion. Okay. Second thing, I joined a little bit late, something else came up. Um, what are your plans from here on out? Ah, yes, um, I'm, uh, so I'll be sticking around for the spring. I'll be continuing my work with the EKY project. Um, and otherwise I have um, a couple of postdoc fellowship applications out and I'll be applying for more if those don't work out. So fingers crossed, I'll have something to do after May next year. Okay, well, good luck and, and again, beautiful job on your presentation today. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. Just um, Brian here. Yes. I, I think you, you keep emphasizing OSDS in coastal zones, but your work in Kaneohe really shows that it's not just a coastal zone. Um, it, there are OSDS that are leaking into waterways that flow into the ocean. So I guess it de depends on how you define the coastal zone, but there are some in the, quite far away from the coast that are also impacting it. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely. And I, I do wonder if, you know, this were a mainland context, well then, you know, it's not that far of a distance to the coast and this would probably get all wrapped into a coastal conversation. But um, here, of course, it's, it's unique because we don't, you know, the islands aren't that big. Um, and, and certainly there are impacts upstream that are also definitely of concern. We have an other raised hand, Jacob, please uh, go ahead. Hi, hey, Trista, it's, it's Jake from a few years back from the RU program. Um, I just wanna say, I think it's, yeah, I had a great presentation. Um, I think it's interesting, you had two different geological settings, one in Australia and one in Hawaii. So I was wondering if you found any differences in submarine groundwater discharge uh, pathways between the two areas where, you know, uh, Australia may have more predictable stratigraphy where maybe it's more fluvial or floodplain settings uh, this discharge would travel through. But um, Hawaii would have maybe a less predictable basaltic geology in which it would travel through. So I was wondering um, how this would apply to maybe, uh, you know, on the mainland where, where we're built upon, you know, the same kind of stratigraphy and how this may differ um, in Hawaii. So, sure. Um, it's worth mentioning in Sydney there, it's, it's also not very predictable. Um, it's a lot of sandstone, but there's a lot of anthropogenic fill, right? So you kind of reach this kind of, I mean, it's different, but you still have this kind of unpredictable pathway because really what, what is in the subsurface? Um, it kind of in the same way that we have lava tubes or, you know, just in the basalt. Um, certainly um, in other coastal areas, uh, particularly I would think on the uh, east coast of the U.S., um, groundwater discharge is significantly greater, right? So, um, or in areas it's significantly greater. In areas such as Florida, um, I would anticipate that this could be even more of a problem. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, you totally did. Thank you so much. Uh, Trista, this is Russell. I, I want to thank you and Dr. Uh, July. This is a great research. Uh, I commend her program for a, uh, giving a better understanding of our, uh, what pollutant sources there are in, on our island. And 
and things. And I, I think the research was, uh, what you did was uh, help me un try to better understand what's going on. I think uh, you also mentioned your research in Australia and one of the uh, emerging contaminants that you looked for was dioxin. So my question to you is, is dioxin still being used in Australia, even though we banned it here in the US? Is it, is it still being used worldwide? No, so and it's been banned in Australia, um, I believe the same amount of time it's been banned here. It just doesn't degrade. So once it's there, it's, it's like um, dieldrin, right? It just stays there. It's very hard to remove once it's there. And that's the problem there. Uh, and are there a lot of cesspool sources over there or just leaking sewer lines uh, that are contributing to this, uh, I guess you call it uh, so submarine groundwater, SGD? Mm -hmm. um, for Sydney, no, it'd be primarily leaky sewer lines, but they do have septic tanks in some of the more rural areas, but not, not where I did my field work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I can't see hands raised, so um, I'm in. Um, yeah, there is, I don't see any hands raised either, and I don't see any questions in the chat. There are many, many congratulations uh, in the chat, so I apologize if there is a question hidden there. Maybe you guys can, uh, whoever posted questions in the chat, can raise their hand and speak up. Uh, hi, this is Eckert from Germany. I can ask a question? Yeah, of course. Ah, cool. Um, I wonder one thing, and it might be a bit naive question, but uh, you, you talked a lot about like uh, wastewater and then pollution and uh, how about cleaning? Like, like um, there, people are always going to be people, and people always make a mess. So, so that there will be dirt and wastewater and, and everything. So, um, is there a way like how to improve cleaning measurements, like technologically? Yeah, so um, one issue right now is that uh, the modern designs of wastewater treatment plants haven't really been designed to um, remove most CECs, right? They, they, because we're just, it's been, you know, really recently in the last 10, 20 years that they've really been even, we've been able to even measure them um, in these really small quantities in the environment. There's a lot of active research in that area, looking at how we can improve wastewater treatment, for sure. Cool. Thanks, Exert. Um, are there any other questions or? Well, I want to thank everyone for attending and thank you for all of these lays. I don't know who all they're from yet, but I'll figure it out. They have tags on them, I've been told. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Trista, for the great presentation. Thank you for everyone in the audience. You had over 109 people uh, attending. Thank you so much. And so, um, again, if you would like to join us at 5 o'clock, I will resend the Zoom announcement for that. So, I would like to ask the committees to stay on and would like to say uh, bye to everyone else.